you were ready. Oh, <laughs> you scared me. <laughs> you just snuck up on me like that. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to light myself a little better. Hey. No, you... I don't know. I liked it. It was uh, very fitting. Can you hear me? Is I... No, you sound good. It's Larry. Yes. After that preamble. <laughs> it's, this this is makes for good podcasting. No doubt. I know. I, it's so nice that you keep coming back on, by the way. So, sure. You know, I mean, I'm not sure. There's so many, everybody has a uh, podcast. And uh, I'm sure you have one, and you don't even, maybe you're not even aware that you have one. That's how ubiquitous they are now. I've have tried to do a podcast. I tried twice with my friend Joe. Uh, but the microphone wasn't working? Yeah. <laughs> no, we did it. Very uh, diligently, okay. Uh, but unfortunately, our our agenda was to discuss politics and the future of the oh yeah yeah of the world, and we got all tripped up by um, sort of identity politics. We felt it was difficult to be assertive and and truthful because we had to watch our step. So it was an interesting experiment in how. Um, it, it's hard to have an opinion in the current culture. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, because uh, yeah, so, yeah, there's going to be, but so it was fine. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. I mean, like, either you're going to offend a percentage of the population, no matter what stand you take or what's what your values that you express are, they're just going to be offensive to people that maybe would never have thought about it. A few years earlier, like five years ago, six years ago. Yes, as soon as I get up in the morning, I'm offending someone. That's obvious now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, um, so yes, one day I'll have a podcast and I'll save the world. But until that time, I remain mute. I hear you. So okay, well, that's going to make this a very short conversation. <laughs> I was just going to talk about the midterms. Uh, yeah. I actually, I what I was thinking considering doing was sort of a pivoting the show this thing into a little bit more of a middle ground where it wouldn't be overtly political but it would be like i would just cover films <clears throat> this is what i was thinking about i haven't taken really any serious steps other than to be a little bit more thoughtful about booking the the show um current company uh, accepted it or included it whatever you're <laughs> don't wanna, I could offend you on this very episode and alienate you if I'm not careful. But I was thinking, you know, I could just program the show, make like choose films that at least the conversations contribute somehow positively to the world, you know? So there's so many films that kind of have the subject matter or the, you know, or different projects that people are working on like your own when you were you were uh doing that podcast i remember talking to you about that and you were blogging about it right uh well, uh, about what are we talking about your oh i'm just saying like you were <clears throat> i remember <clears throat> maybe about 5 years ago it may be a little less than that yeah. i remember you were writing I thought, unless I'm mistaken. Well, listen, I have a long, long-standing project that I started uh, in the early, well, about 2010. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was just trying to sort through, and I wanted to make a feature film that was sort oh. of opinion piece essay about the direction of uh, humanity, if you will. And my co-partner didn't quite see it the way I did. So eventually I made it into a website called right, this, okay this that's what i remember dot com and that's still there and it it lays out a series of uh ideas which seem quaint now because it was in 2016 that i put them together and of course we've uh de uh devolved further since then it was still the idea of the common good being something worth talking about and now that's just sort of been drummed out of the media itself yeah uh, Anyway, obviously we have to save ourselves somehow, so it's worth uh, screaming into the wind, but I find the current environment and the media environment and even the showbiz environment to just be deafeningly intolerant 
on all sides. So it's uh, it's frustrating. And I don't know, like I'm getting, <clears throat> I'm having a lot of, uh, well, I'm having pre-TSD. <laughs> exactly. I agree. Yeah, if you think about the future. It's... Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm actually quite, quite terrified, but that's okay. Uh, tonight, it's just about, well, you and me. Uh, anyway, so I'm living up here. I saw you for a minute, like in Kingston, uh, after that, um, that kind of the state of film or you know, what it was the chronogram and Woodstock Film Festival. Right. Uh, it was some conversation about uh, yeah. making movies upstate with right. various, uh, luminaries and myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was nice. Sure. I mean, it's yeah. Look, I I love making movies upstate. I yeah. Mean, uh, I think it's well. They're different conversations because there's sort of the excitement that Netflix and HBO are up here, but that isn't actually of any good to me. Uh, it's good for the community, and it does prove the point that this is a great place to make movies, and uh, we should have our tax incentives and and so on, but then there's indie film. And that's sort of another conversation. I don't want that to get lost in the shuffle of excitement that Netflix is here because it's a different business model, quite honestly. Um, but let's have it all. Well, so Netflix is here, so they're investing money in the area is what you're saying. Well, uh, I'm saying that a Netflix movie comes to town, that's gonna to be a bigger paycheck for everybody. Right. Right, right, right. And you don't want people to become spoiled and think uh, that's the only way to engage with filmmakers. And, you know, I, I deliberately just made a film I finished uh, a week and a half ago. And one of my agendas was to integrate with the community and some of the vendors. I've gone to their shops for years and say, can I come in here and film and we'll be a very soft footprint. And uh, you know, let's support the arts and mm -hmm. people who come from this area and have, uh, you know, shopped at your, at your venue and let's do that. We all know that we're all waiting for Netflix to show up, but there's also, uh, yeah. community. <clears throat> so. mm -hmm. it's almost a kind of a more cooperative approach or yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. We have a, yeah, you have your grocery store and you have your cooperative and different ways to do the same thing and what is that i i just and i i remember meeting maybe i have the i think i have the card here actually i just pull it out like that um let's, no i don't i thought it was going to be the the hudson the um is that what it's called that was the hudson film organization i met this woman who she was on the was she on? The, I think somebody from that organization was on the panel, and then I ended up meeting the somebody from there at the Woodstock Film Festival. Um, you know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I, it was like HUD C or H U D S Y maybe or something like that. It was a, an organization in the Hudson Valley, which I guess is like a facility to help. Maybe I don't know fundraise, maybe finance, or maybe I don't know pull together resources for filmmaking in the Hudson Valley, or it's a facility, I have to look at them. I should bring her on at some point, but... Um... Well, there were a lot of great uh, voices in that panel. Uh, Laurent, who is long-suffering Hudson Valley Film Commission, wasn't there, and he's who I associate with um, writing an email, giving a phone call to, to get locations and ideas, and uh, he's... Mm -hmm been very supportive over the years um and i feel like he's sort of the backbone i've written many letters on his behalf in order to support the tax incentive which of course politicians are very suspicious of they don't understand how much money a movie does bring in now never mm -hmm. mind netflix versus indie <laughs> film we we just spent a lot of money in the in the local community just buying soda pop and uh ice you know in order to yeah. support our, <clears throat> our, our <throat> troops so uh yeah i associate laurent and the hudson valley film commission with getting the job done but i think there's a lot of other 
interested parties now, and they were probably represented there. I just don't have the memory for that sort of thing. But uh, by all means, they're all worth celebrating. Everybody's contributed in some way. Um, and I appreciated that your <clears throat> excuse me, you bring it back to um, you bring you you kept bringing it back to community and about to uh, making authentic art in the you know with with in the community and it it's it to me it's always going to be um, there'll be an interest in it. I, I mean, I don't think you really need uh, to worry too much about the marketing and the branding. Um, uh, although you're told that you need to worry about that, you're told one is told that that it's you know you have to spend an enormous amount of resources on it. Um, but um, I don't know what do you what do you think about that? Like in terms of your films, what, uh, you I guess you have a track record you can lean on to some degree, right? Friendships and relationships in a lot of festivals. Yeah. Um... I have also a reputation because I mentored so many filmmakers that I have an extended family of people that I'm associated with, which is my, my benefit because uh, I'm associated with Ty West and Kelly Reichert. doesn't mean I have their level of talent or their particular career arcs, but uh, I was there from the start with those guys and uh, I encouraged them and many others, Jim Mickle and James McKinney and various other types, but uh, many of whom, have entered into the workforce, so to speak, <laughs> while I lived <laughs> on the edges. But uh, so I have my own trajectory. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, the bottom line is that filmmaking is a very expensive, difficult uh, enterprise. And, you know, you need a lot of advocates in order to make a movie, which is to say you need a movie star that will get you the money. And then you need the studio or some version of that, or at the very least, a private investor who's deluded into thinking they'll make money off of a, a little film. All of those things need nurturing and uh, capturing. And, and then there's the business of making the actual work and getting in touch with your artistic abilities, you know, and you don't rehearse filmmaking the way you rehearse, even if you're in a band, you get to play, or if you're a painter or a writer. So it's a very difficult landscape. And um, there's a lot of chatter around the edges. You know, they don't always, in my opinion, talk about the actual art form of cinema anymore. They just talk about money and movie stars and deals. And the emphasis is uh, sometimes disappointingly off topic. But all of that is the way of the world. Uh, there's a lot of other things to complain about in the world. <laughs> this is just one aspect. Anyway, I like the art form very, very much. Um, and uh, so I do what I can uh, to build these small pictures. And I also like working cheap or small because you have an ability to integrate with nature and faith and all the other things that are at play. Um, I don't want total control. That's just not how I want to make a film. So it's also my nature. I'm lucky in a way that it suits me to make smaller movies. What would you do, though, if you, let's say, all of a sudden, um, (laughs) I don't know, James Pattinson or or somebody like that would, uh, your, his people reached out to you and said he really wants to work with you. And that actually is not a bad example because he's like worked with, you know, the Safties and he's uh, David Cronenberg and people like that. He's actually a risk taker. Uh, I mean, relative to the, you know, colleagues that he amidst amongst of with which he travels or yeah. bandies. Well, all of this is possible. I mean, I've had certain, yeah. certain cool movie stars express affection for some of my movies. And so then you think the next. But step- then there are people st- that won't let him do it. Well, that's actually very true. And I think sometimes the artists unfettered would do things that uh, they don't end up doing. I I certainly went through this when I was trying to cast my uh, Frankenstein movie. Yeah. The Prey is I really tried to reach out to uh, some of the movie stars that we have great affection for, Mark Buffalo types and and, and 
you know, Adam Driver and, and so on. And, you know, it wasn't my time, so to speak. Um, but uh, any of that is possible. Uh, there's wonderful things in the world. Uh, if somebody in power like Pattinson takes a shine to a project or even an artist, uh, there's something that can develop. But there are a lot of forces that think that's not a great idea and there's a better uh, trajectory for their career. And you can't, well, you can fight that. I always love the story that Wes Anderson wanted Gene Hackman in um, the Royal Tannenbaums. And Hackman said, absolutely not. You know, he was an old salt and he didn't know who this young whippersnapper was. And, uh, you know, Wes stuck with, with it and he went back to him. But there's some great stories like that, but there's just as many stories that aren't told about uh, utter failure at knocking at the door. So, you know, you have to choose. Just your... say, so I guess your thing would be, if you're talking to a movie star, just say Angelica Hewson's in my movie. <laughs> just Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh -huh. I didn't have that ammunition. <laughs> so, but actually that is true about casting. If you say, well, I got these other folks. Right, it's, you can build a it's like a, it's like a Django. Was that what the name of the? I know, but, whatever, with the yeah, blocks that you're stacking and carefully, otherwise one falls out, the whole thing could top, could topple. But I, I wonder what your conversation would be like, Larry, if, let's say, because you get a movie star and you've probably worked with movie stars in some capacities, maybe you were on a set or something, but, but uh, and then, you know, they, they're, they are rumored that they will take over a film a lot of the times. Well, that's... So I wonder what you would, how you would keep control over the project, knowing that maybe somebody who could bring in a lot of money into your film, but maybe you don't want that. So question, because it comes down to really the, that's like saying, would you work in Hollywood to do a remake of uh, wrong turn? I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And also you don't trust, look, you, you put forth your pitch. And if they like it, maybe you trust that that's what they'll do. But they also, they meaning, you know, the folks in power are very skittish and they want to make sure they're keeping uh, their eye on the bottom line. And so they're going to make some, I think, watered down choices. And it becomes less and less the point of why you would make such a movie, any movie. So, you know, you just have to find the balance. It's all about communication and trust and a lot of things that are fraying at the edges in our society there's also just less of an impulse towards art art that speaks of something uh art that challenges and some of the things i grew up on in the 70s movies were really the most important i think uh mode of communication and they were political they were engaged in society. They were trying to make a difference and speak for alternative voices and, and portray, you know, when the anti-hero came up, it was a big deal. That was one flew of the cuckoo's nest and taxi driver. Uh, this whole legacy of, of storytelling uh, has, has been watered down by all the different new uh, mediums from, from Disney Plus to TikTok. I mean, you realized you realize the kids aren't really all on the same, uh, you know, the old cliche of the water cooler conversation. I mean, it used to be that everybody saw Roots that night and they come together and talk about it. But now there's such an enormous array of- Content uh, being coming at everybody yeah. from different, yeah. So that's just, uh, that's the nature of it. You know, that started with cable news. And I remember when they were, you know, they used to be Sports Illustrated and it had a fishing section maybe or whatever. Now it's, uh, there's the fishing channel. There's a, there's fly fishing channel and there's a, <laughs> you know, deep fishing, deep sea fishing, what I have. Yeah, and yeah. most importantly, there's the swimsuit channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that they had other things in the magazine. Yeah, that's right. That's right. First I've heard of it. Why we're talking about Sports Illustrated. All the time. <laughs> my, my um. Yeah, getting back to the beginning of our conversation. Uh, uh, so, uh, but oh, so here's something as you were talking about the '70s films, and and I wa did want to maybe make a uh, illustrate something that might give, if not hope, 
some some interest around this the anti-hero idea so my son who's always been like very straight arrow kid you know he's always been very you know i don't know how to say it like he's just very uh young and safe and yeah he's played it safe i mean you know he's he he lives in brooklyn his friends experiment do with all these, but he's been almost like a straight edge in his yeah. own but then it's interesting he was watching uh breaking bad you know he started yeah. watching it if you <laughs> say that again <laughs> I, I keep missing you you're what you said oh, he's a meth addict <laughs> oh, no he's a meth addict yes <laughs> that's the kind of joke you you hope people can laugh at the first time you say not the third but uh uh so but he no he he it actually had this impact on him because um he said you know don't tell mom this i always that's my favorite way to start a sentence but uh he, he was saying that you know it's interesting because he's a good guy but he sees the moral complexity um of this guy that he's an ant that he becomes this sort of guy who made these makes some choices that are pretty um you know a, a difficult a, well, complicated, you know, about because uh, you know he, he you you've seen it, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I my yeah, son. you know the story. So yeah. anyway, he said, you know, I feel like uh, I don't know, I could drink, have a drink, or you know, take some uh, take a drug. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, but I, I I said, yeah, I mean, I understand what you're coming from. I I I just I was, I mean, he's 18. He's not like 14, you know, <laughs> but he never drank. He has not drank, you know. And uh, which I can relate to. I didn't drink either until I think it was like around his age or later. And um, but I like that he just realized that doing that doesn't necessarily make him a bad person. Right. Yeah. That he can make choices that are not always so um, buttoned up or whatever, you know, and that it doesn't it's OK. It doesn't make you a bad guy. So I just like that. That's the what he took from watching that show. It wasn't you know, just a waste of time uh, or just junk food, you know. Well, look, that's the point. I mean, our, our I'm going to call it cinema. It's not pretentious. It's kind of to elevate uh, the place of movies in our lives. But uh, movies and obviously literature and stuff, it, it matters and it's supposed to matter. It's supposed to be life altering in the, in the right. best possible ways. And I still operate under that hope that your film will make a difference, not necessarily teach a lesson, but be something that affects you in an emotional way that may change your perspective. Mm -hmm. And make mm -hmm. you drink more. I mean, this is the, this is the hope. Uh, so, but you're always making, you. what did, what, what, what did you do? You mentioned you just recently finished a project. Yeah. And what's what's that one? Uh, it's called Blackout, and I shot it upstate in what a uh, shock. September and October. And mm -hmm. I just wrapped, and now I'm editing. And uh, it's my next scary movie. Um, Blackout. Can you, can you name who's somebody who might be in it? Or who is it? Alex, uh, Alex Hurt is the star. Who? Alex Hurt. He's okay. He's the son of William Hurt. Uh, oh. I have a number of of actors in it. Uh, James Legro and Kevin Corrigan and Barbara Crampton and Joe Swanberg and the the usual suspects. Yeah, it's kind of also it's a little bit of a a gathering of of old glass eye. Uh, collaborators in a way uh, of asserting a certain world that I've been um, playing in for some years. And so there's a certain self-awareness in that regard. You might all almost call it meta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just don't just uh, you haven't actually used the expression glass eye picks or glass eye universe. So I appreciate it but the world works. Yeah, and actually, I have used that on the set. Oh. We talked about the monster verse because this oh. is another monster movie, and I have made a vampire film and a Frankenstein film, so this is the next. The logical film. next. Yeah, so that's what I'm up to. It's very deliberate. 
and self-aware and also continues to fill that niche I have of wanting to tell classic horror stories uh, in a modern vernacular. So on I go in my silly folly. I look forward to it. We're going to have to do, I think we should do a, 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 like I'll get on here. I mean, Kevin, I think would do it. He's been on here a bunch of times. He's the sweet, sweetest guy. Yeah. I know James uh, not had success getting him on yet, but you know, polite persistence. He may get on if uh, Kevin's there. <laughs> well, there you go. The building right. blocks again, right? Barbara might, Barbara would do it. She's been on before. She's, She's good about that. I'm sure Barbara would do it, right? Yeah. Well, when is do you have like a what's what's the plan? Is the plan to get it into some festivals first? Well, we'll see. We have to finish the movie. Oh well, we'll you're in post. Yeah, I mean, I've been in post for a week, so it's all right. Actually, right. the future of the film. But uh, one thing I have to say is that I'm very impatient, and I feel that uh, the pomp and circumstances of festivals is something that hasn't always gone my way. So Understood. I will make every effort to um, get into a noteworthy festival and then sell the picture and get it to the public. That's really my ultimate goal. But that's everybody's goal and we'll see if I can uh, follow those steps. <laughs> it's unknowable. I'm going to a film festival nearby I haven't been to before tomorrow film columbia where's that it's in chatham chatham new york yeah how quaint. at the crandall theater what's that i said how quaint that sounds fantastic well i'm you know i have a feeling they just don't advertise because i think it's just a lot of i don't know i think it's a lot of people who live in the area and you know they they just support this theater and then they come out and so me you know that way it's a kind of a nice example of what we were talking about um and they're they're playing some pretty good but the two people that run it have pretty hefty credentials in film industry in terms of peter biskind um who i'm sure you've read some of his work and and uh, larry uh, kardish well, that's sweet. And, you know, obviously they're just in a rural place and having fun celebrating film. And I think, yeah, there you go. Wonderful. And, you know, even a festival like Telluride has a little of that vibe. It's obviously mm -hmm. important, but I think, uh, you know, film as community, as events, uh, people getting together and celebrating uh the work is is fantastic so you should listen to yeah larry uh Kardish, you know he's he's been around way too long you know, doing this stuff so i'm sure he's, i know he's been asked like a million times about his feeling about cinema what's like the biggest things you know changes they're the biggest whatever in things that have had the most impact you know and i was asking him things trying to get get him to t open and he did a little bit he did um and he really just also was just passionate about people going to, he went to see two, two, two horror films, he said. And he goes, you know, you, you want to be in a movie theater, seeing a horror movie, because of course you, you all feed on each other's reaction, of course, but you're also, you're provide one another security and safety in a way, emotionally speaking, of course, um, you know, which you, by yourself you just pause and walk into the kitchen or something if you get too tense you know yeah. it's it's really it was a, a very acute I thought, uh, well, that's know, perspective we, that's how all of this started and you know i i enjoy watching a movie at home um, and you know the thing to remember when we have these conversations is the screens that we have at home and the sound system are considerably better so lamenting the death of cinema in the face of your 60 inch screen is, you know, it's yeah. a different thing than when the alternative was a tiny television. But with all that in mind, the community aspect has faded. And right. also, I feel like a certain entitlement uh, the audience has to get content when they want it, how they want it. There's no sense of anticipation. Um, 
and you know, I still like physical media, which is a whole other really sideline conversation, but I like buying a Blu-ray of a movie I care about, putting it on the shelf. And that movie is always there reminding me that these are the films I've chosen to own, just the way books have that role. You glance up at a, at a book that you maybe haven't read in a long time, or maybe let's be honest, you only read the first couple chapters, but it still speaks to you. And so I appreciate that. That's a generational thing as well. Obviously the kids listen to Spotify, but a lot of us can talk about our record collection and the albums that matter to us and they're worn out from being carried around over the, over the years. All of this is, it's both generational, but it's worth knowing that elders have something to say about the world. And I think when the purchase you made of media and, and books uh, meant something and your collection meant something. So I still stand by those sort of that thinking. Oh yeah, for sure. I think when I moved up here and I finally got all my crap that had been in, in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, Di diaspora, <laughs> like I just, I had some case, some stuff at my aunt's place, some place in storage in New Jersey, some place, some at my dad, you know, and I finally just moved into this place up here and I just got everything together and I just was able to open up my, you know, books and the music and, and, oh, I just felt like here's my identity. Look at that. Yeah. It's, it's very true. Mm. So. Larry Fessenden is the founder and president. To, what is your title at Glass Apex? Creative. Creative. You're the creative. At... Well, when I find stuff, it just says I'm the president, which is something that Donald Trump can't claim. So I enjoy writing that I'm. <laughs> You're right. He's an ex. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks as always. This is fantastic. And um, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, sorry for being a minute or two late there. Yeah, no, it has been fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait for blackout. I'm, it's on the radar, and uh, you know I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I'll hit you up when the time comes. Um, so yeah. Well, yes, yeah, so I'll have to finish it, and then I know, I know, I know. Next year, it's fine. Next by, by, I'm sure yeah. by the well. I'm sure it'll all be some, I don't know, like it, it could be in the spring. It could be, yeah. you know, by the time this thing is all ready to go. Um, so anyway, thank we, we should end it. And then I, I just want to say one, one or two things. All right. So. Goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> exactly. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to mention, you're in the city right now, I think, right? Are yeah, you in the city? Okay. You're, oh well, okay. Because I know you were said you were shooting upstate. Um, but okay, and um, I think I, I mentioned to you though it was a little bit chaotic at the uh, at that event in Kingston. But um, I'm working at a radio station uh, in Red Hook. It's talk about like media and just you know, um, it's just been uh, I don't know so rewarding and. Um, amazing to work in an old-fashioned like independent radio station but i didn't you know really know other than college stations that this type of thing existed and they've got this great formula where the, all of the sponsors are just regional businesses almost entirely independently owned or you know uh, independent businesses so and they're all get behind this radio station and the radio station can play you know i'd say 75 80 percent deeper cuts not not singles necessarily play songs maybe some of it's from classic stuff but you would hear cuts you wouldn't normally hear but a lot of it is just contemporary artists like they'll go to you know you have your big star like a brandy carlisle well instead maybe they her they'll go to somebody or you know and maybe the next few down the pecking order of sing female singers singer songwriters or what have you and so you just get exposed to all this fantastic music that you just don't get to hear in any other radio station well you know i also have been in bands and the whole thing was to be on the college radio station tour. sure and uh and so i have tremendous affection for that also i listen to woodstock radio which 
clearly has the same thing. I mean, they're local uh, restaurants and, and stores. What's the call letters of? Yeah, your I will tell you to give our radio station uh, as like an alternative option, maybe on your, you know, on the radio dial on your uh, in your favorite buttons, whatever you do. Um, it's it's ninety eight one ninety eight point one, but they go by ninety eight one KZE, so it's WKZE is the call letters are the call letters, and it's ninety eight one or one hundred five point nine. If you have trouble with ninety eight point one, they also have one hundred five point nine. I've, I've listened to KZE for years. In fact, oh. almost preferred it to Woodstock Radio, but Beck sort of shamed me into saying, <laughs> why aren't you listening to the actual local? <laughs> You're local. local. Well, yeah. we are, lo but we are local, and they the advertiser are, are in Hurley and in Woodstock, and, um, you know, there are a lot of their our spot sponsors are, and, of course, the signal goes uh, over to there. Um I was yeah. just gonna say I'm on the air from ten to three. Now I'm not saying that you should listen to me because I'm really mostly there. Although I do tell some anecdotes and I'll talk about film, and I'm developing a. I think I mentioned this this to you, but it was in passing that I'm going to develop a a sort of a sh a show on the I think on the weekend, which would be about music in film. Right. Well, keep me Where, close, but I've got lots to say about that. Oh, you can come on and co-host it once in a while. Yeah, I will. Uh, what are you doing from ten to fucking three? If you're not, I'm just in, I'm just what they call back-selling songs, meaning I'm just announcing the songs that were just on, yeah. and I talk about, you know, uh, I sell soap. I mean, in a so in a way, I do the weather, but then and then it's just a matter of you're chatting. You're just trying to keep, or uh, if there are events going on locally, and there have been a lot over the last few months. You know, it's a lot of that is talking about the, a lot of the local uh, festivals and and happenings. You know, whatever food yeah. festivals uh, and as as it should be. I mean, yeah, God, there's still independent radio. It's one of the last. This is so true to it's so non corporate in every way, and it's just it's a very very. I don't know how long I can work there. Like I, you know, I need to kind of have a bigger plan because. But I did move up here without much of a plan, and I landed on my feet. But I need to, you know, grow. And I don't know that a little station like this is a place for me to be able to really do that. We'll see. But it's great now, right now. Uh, it sounds like it's good for your mental health, and that's something. Yeah. Well, and also we're not talking, you know, it's not a political station, so that's good. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. You know, I don't know. I'm going to white knuckle it for the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, it's out of my control. It could be really bad, but we'll see. Yeah, right. Um, I guess that's what I wanted to tell you. Yeah. Yeah, give it a sh listen in, you know, uh, but at least sneak in sometime. But, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not like doing something worth like that's, you know, not like doing a real show. It's a shift, you know what I mean, that I have. That's nice. I like it. Yeah, me too. Cool. It's good to see you, Adam. Thank you. Same here. I met, I'm sorry I missed you at the Woodstock Film Festival, but I, I was, was doing... I was, what? I was filming. Oh, yeah, of course. Right. Uh, the timing. But, uh, you're, but Jack had a... I saw Jack had a short in there. You went to that. A short that he made in film, so he was very excited to present that. It was nice. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let you go, and uh, I'll be in touch. Okay, man. Ciao, ciao. Take care.